Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, after these fantastic answers, probably it's time just to have lunch and, and relax. Uh, but, but we'll try to, to get you some, some information. Just, just a, a quick hands up. Who are you is using natriuretic peptides uh, in the community? Who, who are you using anti-proBNP regularly when there's a suspicion of heart failure in the community? So 50%, huh? OK. OK. So um, these are my disclosures. Uh, I mean, we, we, we have now a number of documents that, that help us to, to do diagnosis. And, and diagnosis is crucial because unless we have a diagnosis, we're, not, we're never going to start with the GDMT. So in 2021, the first um, universal definition of heart failure uh, put uh, this schematic where uh, when you do have uh, the suspicion of heart failure, you have natriuretic peptides in the center uh, to corroborate it. So um, this was quite clear. But at the same year, we had the updates of the 2021 guidelines. Uh, this is the algorithm for suspicion of heart failure in the outpatient clinic. And again, uh, natriuretic peptides in the center. And then uh, depending on those, you go for echo. And we have a year later, the AHA, ACC, HFSA guidelines and we're, we're talking today essentially on diagnosing to start GDMT. Yeah? So if you look to the first um, here, 1A, which is for patients with dyspnea uh, to support diagnosis or exclusion. So it looks like we have the highest indication for the use of natriuretic peptides. The, the thing is that if we, if, if we know how to diagnose heart failure, why don't we do it? So if you have a patient with a suspicion of cancer, it would be absolutely a scandal just to keep it around for, for months and years. And what happens, and this is data coming from the UK, is that too often the patient comes to, goes to the GP with signs and symptoms of heart failure. The diagnosis is entertained, and even years later, three to four to five years later, this patient is admitted to the emergency department, and 50 to 80 percent of patients have their first diagnosis in the emergency department five years later. If this was a cancer patient, it would be dead. But if it's a heart failure patient, we don't care. And, and I think this is a big mistake. I think we need to change our mindset, and we need to go to the early symptoms and start treating uh, these patients as soon as possible. Uh, in this room, probably, we, we have people from across Europe, and one of the problems that we have, and, and we're trying to tackle that from the Heart Failure Association, is the access of natriuretic uh, peptides in primary care. It, one thing is the hospital, my clinics in the hospital or, or the emergency department, that's one thing where uh, um, access is pretty much universal in Europe. What happens in primary care? Look at this. Light green. Light green is UK, Ireland, most of Scandinavia, France, Germany, Austria, Poland, um, some Baltic countries, and Russia. This light green, they have full access, full reimbursement. So these countries, you should know that in your community, you, sh you have full reimbursement and access. If you don't use it, it's because you think it may not be necessary, and we have to convince you that it may help you. Other countries, for example, Spain, where I come from, in Catalonia, we have access and reimbursement, but this is not the case for other uh, regions of, of Spain. In Italy, they have uh, partial reimbursement, but if you look to um, Western Balkans, Greece, uh, Eastern Europe countries, Turkey, I mean, there is a lot of um, inequity in diagnosis across Europe, and these are things that we have to change uh, to, to improve patient care. So uh, the first thing we need to do when we have the suspicion is to, do, to put a name. We need to do a diagnosis. So remember this find HF. Fatigue. In the, in the primary care setting, in the community, the first time a patient comes with 
signs and symptoms of heart failure. It's, it's not often the patient coming with over congestion and pulmonary edema. No, this is the patient that goes to the emergency, uh, goes to the clinic or, or the GP with fatigue. And, and Lisa will show you that this fatigue, this dyspnea, uh, it's not due to age, it's due to heart failure. And, and then if you have fatigue, a patient with fatigue, congestion, dyspnea, use the natriuretic peptides because they are valuable for rule in heart failure. And we will see later how much valuable they are to identify the patients at very high risk very early. So what we have done um, within the Heart Failure Association is to establish an a, a, um, algorithm to, to ruling in heart failure in the community. So when, whenever you have the suspicion of de novo heart failure, this patient that never had heart failure before, um, and you do the, the physical exam, the ECG history, you, you look for the, natu for the natriuretic peptide, nc -pro -BMP. Until now, it was a single cut point. 125. 125 may be too low for our aging population. So 125 is good to rule out, and 125 is good if it's below that to rule out heart failure is very unlikely. To rule in heart failure, um, we have put these cut points here, age adjusted, in three age strata, younger than 50 years, 125 picograms, 50 to 74, 250 picograms, more than 75 years, 500 picograms. These, age, these cut points, where do they come from? These are the 95 percentile from Generation Scotland cohort. So the Scots are probably not Europeans, but they are close to Europe, and, and, and we can use them as a reference for us. This certainly will, will need to be revalidated uh, re in, in, in new cohorts. So if any of you wants to validate this in other cohorts, that would be fantastic. But what we suggest from here is, is something that's very simple, that after this, you need to put your patient in a structured pathway. And this is uh, treat as appropriate. And treat as appropriate if your patient has heart failure. We will discuss later. But uh, it, it looks like we need to start being more proactive and arrange for an echo. Here, in this document, we put six weeks. We were, in a way, mirroring uh, the, the UK NICE guidelines uh, of these six weeks. Lisa, we may discuss later if these six weeks is too late or not too late. What is true is that um, for the high-risk patients over 2,000, um, prioritize echo and evaluation by the heart failure team be within two weeks. We can discuss that uh, with the data that you will, will show us. Anyway, um, what, I, what I want to, to present to you, what I wanted to, to just bring, uh, bring about today is that 50 to 80 percent of the diagnosis for the first time of heart failure are done in the emergency department and they should be done earlier with a more stable patient in the, in, the, in the primary care setting for many reasons, but one of the reasons is that when the patient comes to the emergency department and is admitted, we know that one in 10 of these patients die. So these patients are arriving to the, to the hospital in a very bad condition, and, and we could have done something before. So um, in, the, in the Heart Failure Association, we have launched this campaign, Peptide for Life, and the Peptide for Life is a call for action for natriuretic peptide use and to establish pathways in primary care and urgent care. We have discussed this Peptide for Life campaign with the National Heart Failure Society. So if you want to push for Peptide for Life in your country, um, the, the, the National Heart Failure Society presidents, they know about this campaign. I think this campaign has to be uh, adapted to every healthcare system. We cannot do uh, um, the same structured system across Europe, but there are so many healthcare systems that every healthcare system needs to do it one way or another. So with this, I'm going to stop and I'm, I'm open for questions. Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, the community NT Pro BMP papers were early 2000s. Why are we still talking about this 20 years later? I mean, that's the thing that I find completely amazing. Yeah. Why has it taken us so long? Yeah. 
It, it is probably because uh, in the very beginning, um, natriuretic peptides were used to rule out heart failure. And in, in, the, in, the, in the very early papers, the breathing not properly, and the PRIDE trials in the, in the early 2000s, where, where studies conducted in the, in the emergency department and, and had the main goal of ruling out heart failure. As, as we do have now drugs that are valuable across the spectrum of heart failure, and as we are now having a growing population of patients with HEF-PEF in the community, it's, it's why this has become more and more important, and, and it's, it's really the time to use them as a rule in. So when, when, when a peptide is positive, it's a true positive. It's associated with outcomes, and, and this means that we should move uh, our thinking to optimize treatment. Mm -hmm. Tony, I mean, really impressive you know, presentation here, and it's always mind-boggling to you know, think about these data and the lack of underuse of these diagnostic tests. But one great question from the audience that came in is, you know, we talk about obesity and the interaction with natural peptides, oftentimes being lower in those patients. So a question from the audience is, well, is the MT pro BMP less than 125 threshold still hold for HEF-PEF, an obese HEF-PEF phenotype? Yeah. How do you try to think about diagnosing those patients specifically? Yeah. That's, that's a very good question. Obesity is the only issue you need to worry about when you are uh, diagnosing uh, with natriuretic peptides. Because if your patient is in AFib, the values are going to be higher, so they will be above the cut points. If the patient is with CKD, the values will be higher above the cut points. And these are true positives as well. Uh, it is true that in the community, um, in obese and very obese patients, those that, with, uh, that have uh, BMIs of 35 and 40, you should consider lo lower values for natriuretic peptides. So uh, in, in the patient over 30 BMI, you should reduce the, the uh, NT pro BMP by uh, 25%. Uh, you, consider, you should consider it a lower 25%, 30 to 35%. 30 to 35 BMI, you should reduce it by 35%. Over 35, over 40 BMI, you reduce you reduce 35 uh, percent. Uh, uh, forget about these percentages. The, 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 <laughs> they, 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 they are they are there in the literature. What, what, what I'm just trying to say is that yes, yes, there is a group of patients that fall in the gray zone, which are the obese PEF, and these patients still require our attention as clinicians. And we, and we need to do more. So, unfortunately, um, this is not a clean room. There, there, there is a gray zone that we still don't have a, a, an immediate solution for that. But, but nonetheless, we probably shouldn't get bogged down by the detail. The fact is, without NT pro BMP, we're just never going to detect these cases quickly enough. And that's the, the objective, is to get people into a heart failure pathway really, really quickly. So rather than worrying about the minority, I think we should think about the majority. Uh, and the cutoff levels at the ESC heart failure consensus document is really useful. If, if you want to look at that, it's got the cut, those cutoff levels for both community and for the hospital. And they've also got all those percentages that Tony was just giving us as well. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I mean, don't get distracted with it being especially challenging with obese HEFPEF. I mean, the bottom line is, as Lisa's going to show, there's horrific gaps in what we're doing for diagnostic testing for um, heart failure. And I mean, just when you look at the universal definition, if you just read that verbatim, I mean, how can you actually meet that definition without getting an echocardiogram and natriuretic peptide? It's, it's really impossible. I mean, you need signs and symptoms from structural or functional heart disease. I mean, structural or functional heart disease, how are we going to define that without taking a picture of the heart some way? Um, you could do invasive testing, but the lowest hanging fruit is an echocardiogram. And then you need that corroboration. So you need a natriuretic peptide test as one of the avenues to corroborate. So I mean, we talk historically about heart failure being a clinical diagnosis where you know, we think we can just do it on physical exam and history and all that. And you know, again, I think the data, despite our best intentions, is that our physical exam and whatnot is probably not as good as we think it is in a lot of cases. So I think that's why the universal definition is moving to these more objective measures that are, you know, yes, you need the science of symptoms, but you also need objective testing with echocardiogram and natriuretic peptide testing as like key components here. True. Uh, uh, 
The, the, the fact that the natriuretic peptides were not uh, performed in many laboratories and they, they were not performed in the point of care manner was also a handicap several years ago. Uh, nowadays, uh, you can have a point of care NT Pro BMP in just a few minutes, uh, eight to 10 minutes, you can have that and you can make a decision just within the same visit, which I think that's very convenient for the patient and for the system. And you can see from Tony's slide as well that there was not equity across the whole of Europe, which is why I think we've, we're lucky to have the HFA and this Peptide for Life campaign because it's really important. We're talking about p p places where we have got access and how we can improve uptake, but actually it's really important to make sure we get access across all of the countries in Europe as well. So it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Lisa Anderson again to come here and to explain us what's really happening in, in real life.